what's going on here, and, and uh, we're upstairs with our, our uh, student ministries. God has just been doing some amazing things and growing that group, and they're, they're really enjoying it, and we're enjoying them. And on the 20th of March, we're going to do a youth Sunday, which means the students, middle school and high school students, are going to be in charge of the whole service, everything, from greeting you at the door, being the ushers, um, they're going to be doing the music. They're going to be providing a message in different ways. They're going to be doing some skits and drama. Um, they're preparing for that now. And so um, it's going to be awesome. And I'm going to tell you, you might think, oh, well, this will be a nice, cute little Sunday. You know, the kids are going to help and do stuff. No, this is going to be a powerful Sunday. Uh, they've got a couple of skits that I'm telling you are going to blow your mind. And so you do not want to miss... Uh, the 20th, and, and honestly, this is not a one-time thing. They're going to be doing this at least three or four times a year, so we're excited about it. And it's not too soon to be planning for Easter. Easter is the 27th of March. We are a month away from Easter. Is that hard to believe or not? It's crazy, isn't it? So that's the biggest day of the year for us in the Christian church. It's the day that we base everything we believe on. The historical fact that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. It's the biggest day ever. And so I want to encourage you guys now, whether, whether this is your home church or not, if you just attend here and you've been coming for a while, I want to encourage you to invite somebody for that Sunday. And we've made it easy for you. Out on the guest services desk and even on the table back there, there are these little business size cards that say, come check us out. And it's got all of our information about the church, so you don't have to worry about what do I tell them about this church, you know. You just say, hey, why don't you come to my church? You don't have to say, come with me. Just why don't you come to my church, hand them a card, and do that. And on that Sunday, we're going to talk about, is Jesus the only way? And you know people that have asked that question, right? How can we say Jesus is the only way? Well, I'm setting you up a month in advance to start inviting people. We're going to talk about that, so... It's going to be really cool. But, um, so I want to talk today about the, thing, the one thing that couples list as the number one reason for divorce when they divorce. And that's money. And honestly, it's not really the true reason why people divorce, but people list it as the number one reason why they divorce. It's conflict about money. And so typically what money does for us is it exposes a lot of things in our life. And when Don and I, and Donna's not here today, but we, we, we agree what we can share about our lives and our marriage. When we were going through the worst time in our marriage, money was the thing that made us fight every single time. It was the radioactive issue in our marriage. We could not talk about it in any way, shape, or form. If either one of us brought up anything about money, it instantly became World War III in our home. We just couldn't talk about it. And, and some of you don't, don't elbow your spouse or, you know, look at them or anything. Because I know it's just the way we are. And the reason is money happens every day. Money happens every day. Other things don't happen every day, but money issues happen every single day. And, I, and, and how we view money exposes our values. I want to read a scripture to you. I don't have, um, and i got to have glasses. i got a new Bible, and the print is way too small. For me, So I want to read this scripture to you. It's in Matthew chapter 6. If you have a Bible, um, you can turn there. It's a very well-known scripture. I don't have a slide for it. Sorry, Jason. But um, starting in verse 19, this is what Jesus said. He said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We, we've heard that so many times. And, and we, we really, honestly, we try to disagree with that and say that's not really true. You know, money's just a way to buy the things and pay my bills and whatever. But it's really true that your money will tell you where your heart is. And, that, and Jesus knew that. And then he says the eye is, is the lamp of the body. So if, the, if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And we're going, okay, you're talking about our heart and our treasure. Now you're talking about light and darkness. This makes no sense to me. What are you talking about? He goes on and says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. 
And then he says, you cannot serve God and money. This is a hard statement for us, isn't it? Hello? Isn't it? Because here's the thing about money. Money provides the same thing that God provides without the moral complications. You want to feel successful? Money will make you feel successful. You want to be happy? Money can make you happy. I can buy this car for you. I can provide this house for you. I can give you status in the community. Money will tell you the same thing God does, but it has no moral commitment. So I want to share with you this morning five dangers of money management in marriage. The first is disregarding the lordship of Jesus in your finances. Disregarding the lordship of Jesus in your finances. See, money is typically the last thing we surrender to the Lord. I expected lots of amens on that. Just kidding. It's true. Money is the last thing that we surrender to the Lord. We'll say, God, you can have my heart. We sang it this morning. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. We don't much say, Lord, I give you my money, do we? I don't remember any popular songs written. Lord, I give you my money. I give you my stuff. You know? Because it's the last thing that we want to surrender. And it's hard. I get it. Many of us, and I grew up uh, not wealthy at all, very poor. I was raised as by a single mom. Uh, my dad died when I was young. And it was hard. This was, you know, a long time ago. I'm 50, almost 54 years old. So I, I'm an old guy. And back in those days for a single mom to make a living raising three kids, man, it was tough. It's hard now. It was really hard then. And so we really had pretty much nothing. And so I learned, you know, money is like everything, man. You, you, got, you got money, you got to hang on to it. And so it's really hard to surrender that to the Lord. But it really comes down to trust, doesn't it? And those are the two choices that we have. Are we going to trust God? Or are we going to trust our money? And like I said, money offers you pretty much the same thing that God offers you. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus talked about the deceitfulness of riches. The deceitfulness of riches that it would make you think that you're doing okay when really you're not. In Revelation, Jesus talked about you think you are rich, but you're really poor. You're really poor. See, money will tell you that I can take care of every fear you have. I can take care of every doubt you have. If you've got enough of me, you won't have to worry, right? You got enough of me, all your bills will be paid, your kids can go through college, no problem. They'll be successful, no problem whatsoever. And we all know people that are, that are filthy rich, stinking rich, right? And it seems like not, they never have a problem, right? Am I telling the truth or not? Is it just me, my perspective? It seems that way sometimes, doesn't it? That if you've just got plenty of money, you'll have plenty of everything, happiness, whatever. But honestly, we also know people that have lots of money that are very, very unhappy, that are truly unfulfilled and depressed even. Weekly, you hear stories about people that honestly commit suicide that have tons of money, and you go, how can that be? If I had their money, you know, that's what we think. If I had their money, I wouldn't do the things they do. Well, first of all, we don't know what we would do if we had their money. And so, the other thing is that without God... You don't have security. You cannot have true and total peace without God in your life. It doesn't matter how much money you have. You can have lots of money, and you might have some, you might have some things that I don't have. You might have a beach house. You might have a mountain house. You might have an airplane. I, at one time, I worked before we came here, I worked for a guy, honestly, the richest man I know. Uh, he, he's not the richest man in the world. He's not a Bill Gates or anything like that. But this guy is the richest man I know has more than one airplane, private airplane, um, has, I think, about 18 different businesses that he owns. Um, one was ours. Uh, I mean, this guy, he, he basically got into the Internet uh, sales part, like Amazon and stuff, early on, before, before anybody even thought about using the Internet for business. He got into it and built a bunch of companies and then sold them off at the right time and just got just unbelievably, astronomically rich. But this man does not have Jesus in his life. And, and you could look at him and go, that guy, you know, good looking guy, great personality, lots of money, seems like everything's great, but when you get down to it and you start having a conversation with him, you find out that 
you know, he's not doing so great in his marriage. He rarely sees his kids. And, and I'll just be honest with you. I, I cannot imagine having lots of money and a terrible marriage and not being able to see my kids and my grandkids. You know? But even worse than that is not having the peace and security that I have in Jesus Christ. See, I've been dirt poor. I've been that close to homeless. I really have. And you might look up here and say, you know, Mark, you, you got it all together. You got a, a good looking wife and you got a home and, you know, you, you, you work for the church, you know, and you, you got it made. You work two hours a week on Sunday and that's all you do. And, and I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. How could you be complaining? And, and I'm just telling you, I've been at the point where I had no money, three months behind on rent, working for six bucks an hour, trying to feed a family, and that close to homeless. And it's hard. And it's hard to maintain your faith in God at that time. I get it. I totally understand it. Because you're thinking, God, you said you promised that if I would commit all my ways to you and, and surrender everything to you, you would take care of me. And it doesn't look like you're taking care of me right now. But what God was doing for me at that time was teaching me perspective. He was telling me, God, you, Mark, you don't understand what I'm doing outside of what you can see. And what God was doing in that time was teaching me that it's not all about money. It's more about relationships and mostly that I trust Him no matter what my eyes can see. When our house burned down and we lost everything we had but the clothes on our back, which was a few years later, thankfully I had been through those times that I knew no matter everything was going up in smoke, God could be trusted. That I could trust Him. And we knew while our house was burning, looking at it, going down to nothing, and Don and I both sat in the yard, basically kneeled in the yard crying, say, God, though You slay me, yet will I trust You. And we knew, and we proclaimed right then, God, we know You'll provide a house for us. We know You'll provide clothes for us. You'll provide a future for us. We're not concerned because You have proven Yourself faithful in the past, and You will in the future. And here I am today with a home, clothes, family, a church, and all these things that God fulfilled. Not because of me. Not because of anything I've ever done. Because of Him. Because He can be trusted. And so we need to be able to trust Him in our finances and not be deceived by riches. Matthew 6.33, you've all heard this. Jesus said, Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. The context is money. The context is money. That you have a Father, and I have a Father in heaven that can be trusted. Imagine if your father was Bill Gates. Or, you know, Warren Buffett or whoever, somebody that you know is known as one of the world's richest men. You wouldn't worry about anything financially, would you? And he, and you knew, you knew that your father loved you. Not that he was just your father, but you knew that he loved you. You wouldn't worry about anything. You wouldn't worry about your bills, you wouldn't worry about a house, you wouldn't worry about your kids going to college. You would have no worries whatsoever. Well, we have a heavenly father that loves us with an unconditional love. No matter what we do, whether we serve in church or not whether we come to church or not, He loves us unconditionally. And He can be trusted. And He says to us in these passages, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't you know that I, that I can take care of every hair on your head? Don't you see the flowers in the field and the birds in the air? I take care of them. I feed them. And He says, your Heavenly Father knows what you need before you even ask it. And that you can be trusted. And He just says, here's what you need to do. Just seek Him. Seek God first. Seek me first, God says, and I'll take care of everything else. And the context, obviously, is money. Proverbs 10.22 says, The blessing of the Lord brings wealth and without painful toil to it. There's another uh, translation that says that it brings no sorrow with it. See, it's not how hard you work, although I believe you should work hard. It's not how much money you save, although I do believe that you should save money. It's not even how much you give to the church, although I believe that you should give to the church out of obedience to Christ. It's the blessing of the Lord that brings wealth. 
and it will bring no sorrow with it. When you honor God with all that you have and you surrender to Him and you commit your way to Him, He will provide for you in ways that sometimes just are supernatural, that you just can't explain. And there won't be any sorrow with it. But when you try to do things your way and provide, for, for, you know, provide wealth for on your own and do things your way, there's going to be some sorrow with it. There's going to be some pain with it. There's going to be some trouble with it. And Jesus didn't say, and God never said, you know, I'm going to give you wealth and you'll never have a problem. He's never said that. But He said, God, the blessing of God it is what provides wealth. I want to talk for just a moment about the subject that I hate talking about and none of you want to hear about. Tithing. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 through 12 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be, enough, be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. See, God's blessings can only come from obedience. God just calls us to be obedient. That's it. Trust Him. Be obedient to Him. And this is the only Scripture that I have found in the Bible that God says, test me. Test me. If you don't believe that I'll take care of you financially, test me in this. He doesn't say that in any other area. Although I think you could, it doesn't necessarily say that. But this one Scripture says in the area of finances, test me in it. And I'll pour out a blessing that you won't have room for it. And he says, not only that, I'll keep the devourer away. You might think, well, if I give, if I tithe, you know, then God's going to, suddenly I'm going to see a check show up in my mailbox for $100,000. And that may happen. It's never happened for me. It might happen for you. But God has done other things for me. He allowed me to have vehicles that lasted 250,000 miles. You know, and they didn't break down and I didn't have major engine overhauls and stuff like that. That's the blessing of God. The children of Israel, when they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years, their shoes didn't wear out, their clothes didn't wear out. God provided for them in other ways that they didn't understand, but you just have to be obedient. And it may not be that you get filthy rich, but God will provide in ways that you just can't comprehend it. And, and I'm just saying, if you're obedient, God says what I'll do is I'll bless you. I'll keep the devourer away. He says I'll, I'll guard the front door and I'll watch the back door. I won't let the enemy sneak in while you're watching and serving me. I'm going to take care of the front door and the back door and you won't have to worry about it. You just be obedient to me and I'll take care of it. That's a good word, isn't it? Alright, let's move on. Uh, second, danger of money management in marriage is disrespect of your spouse's financial in input. This is a tough one. This is a tough one. Because many of us grew up, especially men, let me talk to the men for a minute, many of us as men, the older guys especially, we grew up that the men are the head of the home, uh, the provider of the home. Uh, back in the day, uh, only the men worked and women typically stayed home, took care of kids and did whatever. But It's not that way anymore. It hasn't been that way in a long time. But we were kind of raised, many of us, in a culture where our fathers and grandfathers, uh, they worked and our mothers and grandmothers stayed home, right? Am I, am I the only one? I'm not, I'm not the only one. Um, and that's just kind of the way it was. But you have to understand, your spouse is an equal partner in your marriage. We're talking in the context of money and marriage here. Your spouse is an equal partner in your marriage. In Genesis, in the beginning, when God created man and woman, He didn't mention who was the boss. There was no reference to who was in charge or authority. He made them partners. He took women from the, from the man's side so that you would be partners together. And so if you're disrespecting your spouse's financial input, and this can be women just as easily as men. It's not just men. It's certainly women as well. Women can be dominant in this area as well. But I have a question for you. How much can you spend without your spouse's approval? Don't answer that. How much can you spend without going to your spouse and saying, Hey, is this okay? Is it $100? $20? $1,000? I know people that have gone and bought houses 
and cars without ever mentioning anything to their spouse. How do you think that conversation goes over? Now, some of you may have done that. I'm not saying. I I don't know. But I can just tell you what would happen in my house. My wife's not even here. And I can tell you, and you all are laughing because you know what would happen. You know her. I know what would happen too. Are you out of your mind? You better go fix this. I know better than that. But there is an amount that we, we understand that we can spend without going to each other. I believe that we should be partners together. We should pray together about finances. We should communicate as often as possible about money. And we do. But, how much can you spend without your spouse's approval? And there may be, it may be zero. Maybe, maybe it's $100, but it's a good question to have. Maybe, maybe that would be a good homework for you guys. Go home and talk about, hey, how much can I spend without your approval? Um, just be willing to be open, okay? And if, if you're thinking it's going to be $1,000 and she says $20, um, just say, I think I need a break. And then you can come back and talk about it. But that's a good question. And do you pray together about your financial decisions? Do you pray together? before you do anything major? Do you pray about it? Sometimes we just, sometimes I think we have so much intelligence now and so much information on the internet and on the TV and, and, and even in churches that we have so much information that we don't rely enough on God for our decisions. And see, God owns everything. And so my question to you as a couple is, do you pray about your financial decisions? Do you sit down and say, God, what do you want us to do? about this situation. We, we, it looks to us like we need a new car, but God, what would you have us do? And if you'd have us buy a new car, we need you to provide that one for us. And, and Donna and I started doing this many years ago. God, we, we, we have a desire, or we think we have a need here, and we're, we're going to trust you to provide that need for us. And, it, and God has done it in every, every situation. You guys that know me know I have a Jeep. Uh, I love my Jeep. And, I, and I, we prayed for that Jeep. Some of you guys know that. Some of you guys were praying for me a Jeep when we came here last year. And a few months later, God provided it for us. Now, now some of you go, are you the most materialistic pastor in the world or what? I, I'm just being honest with you. I'm not materialistic. I'm just saying I wanted a Jeep. I live in Jasper, Georgia. I should have a Jeep. Right? Amen. I heard an amen. I, I'll take that. And I, and I love it, and, and it's therapy for Don and I, honestly. It really is, but, but I wanted one. But I wanted the one that God wanted for me. And we prayed about it, and God provided it. Now, that's, that's silly and inconsequential. But do you pray about serious things too? What about your job? What about your job? Do you guys pray about your job? Some of you, some of you are looking for a new job. Some of you have your eyes open looking for the perfect job for you. Are you praying about it? And are you praying with your spouse about it? God, we believe you want us to be in a different business. Maybe some of you have had the desire to be in ministry. I did for years and years and years. I wanted to be doing what I do right now. And we prayed for 14 years. God, we know and we're, we're praying. Provide, open the door, open the door, open the door. For 14 years before we came here. God is faithful. But it's always going to be in His timing as well. When you see money... And I have no money. Maybe I have a dollar. I, I, I meant to, I love to use visuals. I'm at, does anybody have a $100 bill that I can borrow? Oh, darn. I almost got you. I thought you were going to bring it to me. I thought if I get my hands on that $100 bill. Um, but I was going to bring a $100 bill and, and show it to you. So imagine a $100 bill. What do you see when you see money? Maybe you see lunch for your family, groceries, yeah. Maybe you see a power bill being paid. Maybe you see gas for your next upcoming week or, you know, books for uh, your kid's college or whatever it may be. But we all see money differently. And there's different ways. I think I missed one. No, I didn't. There's different ways that we see money. There's, there's actually four different ways that we all see money. And I want to read these to you, and I want to see if you uh, see yourself in this. Different money languages. The study's been done. A driver is number one. A driver. driver. To a driver, money means success. Uh, it protects against incompetence, and it makes you feel more confident. If you have money, you feel like you're successful. You're a driver, and that, that's what you 
you look at. When you see money, that's what you see. And amiable, amiable is second. Money means love and affection. I, and I know that that's part of my, my money language. That relationship and people are the most important thing to you. When you see money, you think, hey, we can all go out to eat. We can go on vacation. I can take the kids to Six Flags or whatever. You know, we can have fun together. And that's, that's what an amiable sees when they see money. Analytic. An analytic money means security. Saving. You know, I, I, I want to save money. It, it wards off chaos and problems. And typically an, an, uh, an analytic is very well structured and very well planned. They love budgets. They love keeping things the, all the T's crossed and the I's dotted. That's what an analytic does. And then an expressive. To an expressive, money means acceptance and respect. Acceptance and respect. And they purchase, you know, they, 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 they like to buy things. They like to go shopping and buy things. Look what I bought for you. Look what I got for you, you know. And, and so, you know, I bought you this outfit or the trampoline or whatever. And uh, that's what an expressive does. And, and so here's the thing about those four things. And I'll ask you a question. How many of you saw yourself? We typically have one of these, and sometimes two or three, but typically we have one dominant money language. How many of you saw yourself in one, in one of these four? Keep your hands up for a minute. You saw yourself in one of these four. Many of you, almost all of you. Okay, put your hands down for a minute. How many of you saw your spouse in one of these money languages? How many of you? Just, just about as many hands. Okay. Now, how many of you, last question, how many of you are different than your spouse? Put your hands back up. Just about the same amount. Okay. And some of you are lying, I know, because you're afraid you're going to get elbowed or something. All of us have at least one of these traits that is dominant and often sometimes more than one. And again, it can change, by the way. Donna, when, Don, when we first got married, Donna was and, and I learned, we kind of learned this. Donna was absolutely an analytic, and she still is. She's very generous. She's very caring and compassionate. But she is an analytic. Money means security to her. She wants to know that we've got enough money that if, if you know, the, the dishwasher breaks, we can go get another one. You know, if something happens, we don't have to stress and panic, and that's what money means to her. Well, I, I was an amiable, without a doubt, 100%. And I'm still very much that way. To me, money means let's go have fun. You know, in, in our home, when our kids were little, um, I was the fun one. I can say that because she's not here today. I was the fun one. And whenever we had money, I wanted to go do stuff that was fun. I wanted to go play, you know, games and go to the park and, and go on vacation, man, and let's go to the, you know, go-kart track and the water park and all this stuff. That's, that's what money means to me is let's do stuff together and fun. And don't worry about paying the bills. Let's just have fun together. You know, and, that's, and I still feel that way. In, in September, we're taking all of our kids and grandkids to the beach for a weekend. They're going to they're gonna be with us uh, for a weekend. And we've been planning this, honestly. We've been trying to do this since our kids were grown for, I don't know, uh, 10, 12, 15 years, trying to get them all together at the beach, and we finally worked it out. And I'm so excited about it because I'm an amiable. I, I, I love to be able to do stuff like that and just show love, and some of you are. Here's the thing about those things. Each one, and, and you gotta, you got to remember this too, if your love or your uh, money language is different than your spouse, don't judge them. Don't judge them. God made you different for a reason. And often, if you have the same money language, I've known people, I've known couples that were both amiables, and they're the sweetest people in the world, but they have no money. And they have no money saved for any trouble. When something happens, it's just a devastating to their family, and their kids suffer because of it. And, and if you're both analytics, you have lots of money in the ba bank, but, but your kids hate you. You know, because you're never doing anything, you won't even go out to dinner. You know, you got to half a million dollars in the bank, but you won't take them to McDonald's for lunch, you know? It's like, really? I mean, come on. So, so God makes us that way for a reason. And, and in organizations, it's the same way. The people view money in an organization. It works really well when you have somebody in a church, for, for example. We have people in leadership that I believe are analytics, and they focus on the money. We need to be careful. We need to take care of the money. And then you take people like me that say, no, we need to spend our money on outreach and, and do things in the community. And that's all good. And some of you, when you hear that, you go, wow, I'm with you, Mark. We should do that. 
But we need the analytic to say, wait a minute. We need to be wise with our money. If we just say, let's give it all away, then we won't have enough to pay our bills. And before you know it, we're not doing anybody any good. And so it's good in a relationship that you have different money languages. I want to I uh, give you the positive to a driver. A driver shows love. Each one shows love in a different way. driver shows love by sharing. A driver shows love by, I'm sorry, driver shows love by spending. An amiable shows love by sharing. An analytic shows love by spending. I mean saving. An analytic shows love by saving. I did that totally wrong. Can y'all forget that I said any of that? A driver shows love by showing. Here's what I got you. Does that make sense? Shows love by showing. An amiable tells you I love you by sharing. An analytic tells you I love you by saving. An expressive shares love by spending. Here's what I bought for you. Here's what I bought for you. So if you have the same money language, you have the same strengths, which are these things, but you also have the same weaknesses. Here are some of the weaknesses. For a driver, they can be over-dependent on money for their self-esteem. It can be very dangerous. An amiable can be a poor money manager and not be well prepared for the future. Amiables don't think much about budgets or saving. An analytic can be insensitive to people, the needs of people, or the voice of God. That pencil is more important than you are. You know, paying the power bill is more important than the hungry person. But again, we need those people. And then an expressive, their weakness, it says they use money like some use alcohol or drugs. They use it to medicate, self-medicate themselves. And we know people like that as well. You know, they're depressed. I'm going to go shopping. You know, I don't feel good about myself. I need to, go, need to go buy something. But here's the thing. With your strengths and your weaknesses, you're better with your spouse if you're different. And don't judge them. In our, in our family, and I've changed a little bit. I'm not as much of an amiable as I was. I, I have more of the analytic in me now because some of the hard times that we've been through, and I, I think God did that to, to make me more wise with our money and not just spend money all the time and give all our money away. Um, so God's kind of changed that in me. But I'm still, my dominant money language is amiable. And Donna's is still analytic. But yet she is the most, one of the most generous people I know. She'll give you anything. But when you're, when you're different like that, don't judge each other. You know, we used to judge each other so bad. We used to look at each other and I'd just say, you're, the, you're going to be one of those ladies that, that dies alone with your money stuffed in your mattress, you know? And she said, well, you're going to die on the street corner because you don't have any money and you don't have a place to live. You know, it's just, and we judged each other for these stupid things. But what we didn't realize is that God made us that way and put us together so that together we could operate the way He wanted us to. And we could be smart with our money and get along. And it's really hard. I get it. But God made you that way for a reason. So I want to move on. The third danger of money management in marriage is dominance of money and financial decisions. Dominance is just disproportionate control. And this is just as many men as it is women, by the way. It's very common that you're not partners in your money management. Do you share? And this goes back to some of the earlier messages. It's not necessarily about the money. It's how you look at money. And what do you value? See, honestly, when it comes down to it, we argue about values. We really don't argue about money. And I can prove that to you. Every time Don and I ever argued about money, it was tied to something either I wanted to do or what she valued about the money. We should be saving. And I, my thought was we should be having fun and enjoying it. The money's provided for us to enjoy life. See, that was our value. We valued certain things. And that's, you do the same thing. You value certain things. And if your values are different, you'll, you'll defend your values above everything else. It doesn't matter if you know, yes, we shouldn't spend all our money, but this is how I feel. And that's what we argued about. But do you share? Or does someone dominant? Many men often, 
And, I, and listen, and I'll, I'll back this up with Scripture. Men, you are called by God to be the head of your home. You are called to be the spiritual and, and actually practical head of your home. And what that means is, you should be the sacrificial leader of the well-being of everything that goes on in the home, putting everyone else's desires before your own. That's the head of the home. That you, you take an active role in the finances, in the raising of your kids, in the spiritual life of your family, in every way. You are the initiator of the well-being of the home, but you're putting others in front of you and their desires in front of yours. And, and I know this is hard. I, I get this is, this is challenging. This is, you know, if you've ever had a, a, a really bad scrape on a knee or an elbow or something, you get a bandage and then you rip the bandage off and it hurts bad, doesn't it? This is kind of ripping the bandage off. I get it. It's hard for us to hear this sometime. You are the call to be the head of the home. And if you're not married yet, you, you, you single guys, I'm telling you, you are called to be the head of your home when you get married. But that means you're the loving initiator of the well-being of the home. You take charge, but you do it in love and submission as Christ loved the church. And as he, as he cuts what He calls us in Ephesians 5, you submit to each other as Christ did to His church. How did He submit to us? He gave it all, didn't He? He gave everything He had for us. He didn't hold anything back to us. And man, we're called to be the leader of our home just as Christ loved the church. Number four, danger of money management in marriage is disagreement about financial decisions, priorities, and values. This is chronic disagreement about financial decisions, priorities, and values. Amos 3.3 says, do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? The answer is no. They can't. It's impossible. It's impossible to disagree and succeed. That's why you hear us in the church talk about unity a lot. We have to agree to succeed. Um, Jesus in Luke eleven seventeen said, it says, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and a house divided against itself will fall. Let me talk about a budget for a minute. Budgeting is not about the numbers. Now, for many of you go, what are you talking about? Mark? Budgeting is about the numbers. No, it's not. It's about what you value. It's about your priorities. It's about what's most important to you. And so, early on in our marriage, I loved to play golf. I loved to, uh, uh, to play softball. Golf was much more expensive than softball. And so, I would just play golf three times a week on the weekends. I'd come home and practice. I'd buy new golf clubs. And, you know, it wasn't very good, so I lost a lot of golf balls. So, I'd have to buy more golf balls and stuff like that. And I was spending lots of money on that. And Donna, Donna we talked about this before. She didn't hate golf. She wasn't against golf. She was against the fact that it took her time, took me away from her, which she thought was her time. But also, I was just spending money without any kind of conversation or agreement about it. And so, we always had arguments about golf. Listen, if you sit down together and decide, okay, I'm going to spend $100 a month on golf, and you've agreed on it, then at the end of the month, when you spent $200 on golf, then you got a problem. But if you agree, sit down and agree and say, I'm going to spend $100 on golf, and at the end of the month, you're right there at $100, then there's no problem, right? It's with the agreeing. It's the agreement that takes all the tension out. And, and we challenge people often when we do marriage coaching or counseling. This was one of the, this, like I said, this was the radioactive issue for us. We could not talk about money. Donna would stand up here and tell you the same thing. We just couldn't. And when God started healing our marriage, and we learned some of these things, we were challenged to sit down and come up with a budget as long as it took. And it took us almost right at six months. I'm not kidding. I know some of you go, really? I can do a budget in five minutes. No, it wasn't the numbers. It was the agreement about the values and the priorities in our life. And it took us six months of, okay, let's talk about a budget. Fight for three or four minutes. I need a break. Go back. We had to do that. For almost six months, I know that sounds ridiculous, but here's the thing. If you're arguing about money the way we did, and it's always a problem like it was for us, what is five or six months in your lifetime? 
if you if you could be guaranteed that okay, if we'll work through this hard thing for five months, six months, maybe it'll take you two months, maybe it'll take you a month, maybe a week, maybe a day. But for us, it was almost six months. If you could say in six months, we're going to sit down and work all this out and know that we'll never have another argument about money, would it be worth it? Would it be worth it to you? That's exactly what happened for us. It took out any argument we ever had about money. And we've been married for, we're in our 21st year of marriage now. And we did this, we were probably in about year four, three or four of our marriage, and we fought constantly about money. But we spent five, six months working through it, and we finally agreed on our values, our priorities, and came up with a budget. And we have not argued one time since about money. Not one time. And we can sit down today and talk about money, budgets, any, anything like that, and not have an argument. Can I tell you it's worth it? I promise you it's worth it. I promise it's worth it. So I want to challenge you that you do that. Because you just agree. Then you, you, and here's what you do. You, you're having a proactive conversation. There's three types of conversation. There's proactive, there's reactive, there's radioactive. Proactive, reactive, radioactive. And if you can have a proactive conversation about finances and work through these issues, however long it may take you, it will save you a lifetime of arguments that you won't have to have ever again. And at the end, you agree. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision or revelation, you know, you've heard this, the people perish. I, re- I like the version that says the people cast off restraint. Where there's no revelation, people cast off restraint. We often misuse that verse, I think, sometimes to say like in church that we need to have a vision. We need to have a long-term vision. But what the Scripture really says is if you don't give people any kind of a revelation or a vision for what you're trying to do, they don't know what to do. They just cast off restraint. They're just going in all kinds of different areas. And that's exactly what we were doing with our finances. And it's the same in any organization. If, if your business has no vision, no revelation, People are going in all kinds of different directions, right? We work for companies like that. We hate it, don't we? Because it's like, what are they doing? It makes no sense. And I want my home to make sense. And so we need a vision, a revelation from God. God, how do you want us to handle our finances? How do you want us to honor you with what you've you've given back to us? And when you do that, everybody's in agreement. Okay, the last um, danger of money management is debt. Um, In every case that you can, pay cash. As much as you can, pay cash. Credit cards, I believe, are a tool from the devil. Now, I'll say this. I have two credit cards in my wallet right now. I have one for the church, and I have a personal one. It's almost like in some ways you can't even live without a credit card anymore, right? But we made, we made a decision. We got deep in credit card debt at one time, and it was awful, awful debt. And We made a decision many, many years ago. We were going to get out of debt. And we lived like hermits, honestly, for a while um, to get out of debt, pay extra on our mortgage and pay off our credit cards. And when we did, the first thing we did was we cut them up. But then we realized, well, you got to have one for some, some issues. So we pay off our credit cards every month. What little bit we use them, we pay it off every single month, so there's no interest accrued. Some people use, I know people use a credit card for business so they can get points, and, and sometimes that works. I have an Amazon credit card. I buy a lot of stuff from Amazon. I get points on that, and so I can get free stuff from Amazon every now and then. But we still pay it off every single month, and in every case you can. Please, 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 I'm, I'm telling you, especially you young guys, don't ever get a credit card. Pay cash, pay cash, and live within your means. I heard it said one time that uh, we need uh, margin in our lives. We need margin in every area. And I thought this would be a great sermon series, that we need to have margin in our lives, right? You you understand what I'm saying? Margin is the area between uh, what you have and then the limit that you have. Everybody has a limit, true? Everybody has a limit. If your limit on income is $50,000, that's your limit in your home, you can't spend more than that. You just can't. And some of you go, you just don't know me, Mark. I can do it. Um, Yeah, I understand it. I've done it too. But it will just get you in trouble. So the more margin you can have, if if here's your level, your limit, you you, you can't do any more than that. You want to get as far below that as you can so that you can go, 
You know, you don't want to be to the limit in time, but especially in money. And some of you don't know what it's like to live within margin on time, do you? You get up at the last second, right? You know, I got 10 minutes to get to school or to work. It'll take me eight minutes to get ready, seven if I rush, six if I don't wash my hair, you know, and you got it down to the minute, right? I know you do. I see it. And you're pushing it to the limit. So if anything goes wrong, you're past your limit. And then, there's, then your stress level goes up, right? You're like, I got six minutes to be there. The traffic, the news, the radios tell me it's going to take 20 minutes. And your stress level is going through the roof. Anybody been there? I've been there. Here, you want to be as far below the margin as you can in every area, but especially when it comes to finances. And credit cards will choke the life out of you. Last Scripture I want to leave for you. David, would you come up and just play something and ask the prayer team to come on up? Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12 says, if any, And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. And a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. I leave with that Scripture because some of you have heard different things today. You've heard budgets. You've heard about how your husband or wife is viewing money or you view money and maybe it's been eye-opening. Maybe it's made you more upset because you think they're out of control. I want to tell you, none of that really matters. What matters more than anything else is that you agree. In chapter 2 of Genesis, God says, I'm going to take the two and they'll become one. When you get married, you get ready to get married and you stand on the altar, God takes the two of you and He puts you together as one. You live that way. You make your decisions based as one. But I want to tell you something. It's not just you and your spouse. When you do marriage God's way and you do things God's way, it's three of you. That's why it says a cord of three is not easily broken. Your marriage is not you and your spouse. It's you, your spouse, and God. And when it's you and your spouse and God, that's a cord of three that can't be broken. And so you need to start doing things, and and I'm telling you from experience, if you'll start doing things God's way and looking to Him and including Him on your financial decisions and saying, God, what do you want us to do as a couple? And we're going to come together unified no matter what. We're not going to let anybody divide us. Not a child, not the enemy, not a job, not anything. We're going to be unified. Then that's a cord of three that can't be broken. And today, many of you need to decide we're no longer going to be a marriage of two. We're going to be a marriage of three. God's going to be the center of our marriage. And from this day forward, we're not going to do it on our own or just the two of us. We're going to do it in unity with God as the head and the two of us partnering together. And I promise you, I said this in the very beginning, it doesn't matter what you know. It doesn't matter. It matters what you do. It matters what you do. You have a Father that loves you and wants you to be blessed. Wants to provide for you. He wants you to have more than enough. Psalm 23 says, My cup runs over. The Lord is my shepherd. My cup runs over. Why is that? Because God wants to bless us so we can bless others. He doesn't want us to have to worry about every little penny so that we can't help anybody. He wants to bless us so that we can be a blessing to others. But we've got to be in unity. And you have a Father that loves you and wants to provide for you everything. He gave everything He had for you on the cross. How much more will He give for you in the area of finances and blessings? But you have a choice to come together in unity and be obedient to Him and receive His blessings or just keep going like it's going for you now. Money is a great blessing, but the blessing comes from God and it comes from obedience in God. And some of you maybe, like me, you don't have your spouse here today. I want to challenge you to have the hard conversation Go to your spouse, your husband, your wife, and say, I want us to be one again. I want us to be in unity and have God as our head and let Him handle every decision we have. And I'm going to ask you, if you come to the front, if you're a couple here today and you decide, I want to be in unity 
You're going to have a prayer team up here to pray with you. But this is your time to be with the Lord and decide we're going to be one from this day forward. God is our head. And we're going to be a cord of three strands. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your word, God, that tells us as we come together as a couple and as we come together with you as our head that we, we make this type of rope, this type of cord that comes together that cannot be broken. And we're trusting you this morning, God. We know that this is hard for many of us to, to understand and to submit to. But God, I pray that you'd give each of us the wisdom to know what we've heard and how to handle it and what to do with it. Give us the courage right now to God to step out in faith. No matter what we've done in the past, that we would right now become a couple in unity with you as our head. In Jesus' name we pray. Altars are open to you.